So y'all take it away. Jennifer, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming back for our session and for telling me that you can't hear me. Um, uh, today, we're going to talk about descript descriptive equity and historic sheet music. And Lauren and I are going to go. We're going to go first. Lauren, I'm the Jennifer McGillan, the coordinator of manuscripts. And Lauren is Lauren Geiger. She's the metadata librarian here at Mississippi State. And then we're going to have Xavier Savels, who is our one of our um, history PhD students, and he will be uh, also joining us today. So we'll get started. Oh, okay. So uh, this project was inspired by the work of Dorothy Berry. She's the digital collections program manager at Harvard. And her project, Descriptive Equity and Clarity Around Blackface Minstrelsy in HTC Collections, provided an invaluable template for this project on multiple levels. Um, and uh, Barry's project includes an actual descriptive template, uh, which she very has very kindly and graciously put under a Creative Commons license so that the rest of the library world can use it. Uh, and then I've I have included. Uh, the last her uh, preferred citation for uh, for her work and for that template. So at uh, Mississippi State, we had started by using Barry's template to create contextual information for a display of historic sheet music in the Charles H. Templeton Muse Music Museum, uh, and that was something that Kate Gregory and I uh, worked on as part of our work in the exhibits committee. And we created that in response to a, uh, a patron inquiry. And once we had done that, we're kind of, uh, you know, also being like, well, how, how else can we use this work? And so the next thing was to add the information to the Templeton digital collection, as well as to other uh, digital material that had to do with blackface and racial performance and minstrelsy. So, uh, so how is this connected to the, to the, to the PhD student? The Mississippi State History Department requires PhD students to complete two skill internships, which includes archival skills and archival skills are interpreted very broadly. So that encompasses processing collections as well as digital humanities work. And it provides both the students and the department, uh, in this case, manuscripts, with unique opportunities to uh, to utilize their the PhD student specialized knowledge, um, and then now it's Lauren's turn, <laughs> so I'm going to mute myself. All right, everyone, thank you again for being here. Um, just a reminder, I'm Lauren Geiger. I'm the metadata librarian. And so when Jennifer brought me onto this project, I had never worked with a PhD candidate before. With undergraduate students, I usually gave them a project that had specific parameters and objectives. After Jennifer told me more about Xavier's background and his research interest, I decided that a collaborative approach would be best for this project. I know how to work with metadata and over the last two years have attended several reparative description reparative description webinars, but I haven't actually done this work before, and I am by no means a subject matter expert, although I am very interested in this work. Fortunately, Xavier is an expert. His research into minstrel music, bully songs, and their effect on early 20th century society and today's society made him honestly the perfect person to assist with this project. It really was sort of um, all the pieces fell into place to make this what it was. And his own research and experiences with archival materials also make him a user, make him a user of these materials. And user feedback in any kind of remediation project is extremely useful and really hard to get. So again, this is just making this project even more valuable. Xavier and I were able to work together to balance the technical and really jargony side of metadata with the practical aspects that would be most beneficial for users to create a balanced descriptive metadata. 
By working together, I've gained some more practical insight to working with reparative descriptions and mass metadata. While Xavier was able to get his hands on research material that would benefit his own personal studies, and he was able to majorly assist with establishing reparative policies that we hope to use going forward. Next slide, please. So, the overall scope of this project is to apply reparative descriptions to the Charles, Jace Temple, Charles H. Templeton sheet music collection, which consists of over 25,000 pieces of music. And we had Xavier for one semester. And we didn't start on this project until late September, early October. So clearly we were never going to get all of these pieces of music of music fixed, especially since that at that moment we were looking at doing heavily individualized entries, which well, heavily individualized entries means that if there's greater access and discoverability for that individual piece, that takes a lot of time. So to get the most out of this collaboration, we focused on our strengths. Xavier's subject matter expertise and general excitement to work with these materials, which is very important, and my metadata knowledge and project management. Xavier had, an exa had a sample of 100 pieces of music to work with, and from this sample, he was able to see that the Templeton collection also had several examples of red face, brown face, and yellow face, as well as black face in the, in the collection. The plethora and range of these pieces depicting racial performances had the project switch from individualized entries to creating an application profile that other student employees or interns could use. As a subject matter expert, Xavier's skills were best utilized in creating the application profile and starting to create a bibliography that we could use to expand and alter the profile as we applied it to more collections. This was overall the best combination of our skills because again, Xavier, he is just so knowledgeable in what he does. And Jennifer and I are currently working on expanding the project and looking to potentially reach out to Southern Miss or to any of the other graduate programs in the state of Mississippi to continue to further on this project and make sure that we can make and ensure that all 25,000 pieces of music do have reparative work done to them. Besides just covering the descriptions, Xavier and I are continuing to spend a lot of time on choosing subject headings and keywords for the Templeton collection and reviewing terms that could be proposed as subject headings. Right on the ball, Jennifer is about to tell you to switch slides. <laughs> so for a little bit of background information, subject headings and keywords or author supplied keywords as they appear on the slide are two types of terms that can be used to describe a resource. Subject headings come from controlled vocabularies that are created and monitored by different information groups. The Library of Congress subject headings are generally one of the best known subject heading vocabularies and is the main one used at Mississippi State Libraries. The list is controlled by the Library of Congress as the name implies. The subject headings are fairly rigid in their terms or string of terms, and that results in very specific or narrow search results. Keywords are not from controlled vocabularies. They're best described as natural language terms or words. For example, World War II is a key term is a keyword, but World War, comma, 1939 to 1945 is the subject heading. Both mean the exact same thing, but the keyword is more user friendly, while the subject heading is far more specific. Keywords generally result in a wider variety of search results when used. Together, both keywords and subject headings are powerful tools that can help users find materials. And while subject headings generally hold a bit more weight due to the interoperability they provide between different systems and the time and effort it goes into creating them, more and more platforms are using keywords because keywords interact better with Google. And Google is, as most of us are probably aware, the main way that people are finding materials now. It's just, it is what it is. So we really want to balance both of them together to be able to make our materials as discoverable as possible. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned two slides ago, Xavier and I are working on proposing a new term to go into the Library of Congress subject headings called racial performances. Minstrel shows, minstrel music, and blackface entertainers are all current subject headings, and they're all rooted in the practice of blackface. 
Racial performances, however, broadens that category to be able to cover the red face, yellow face, and brown face that um, Xavier found while going through our collection. The Library of Congress proposal system is an involved process because you have to prove that the term you want to add is necessary and adds new meaning or context that is not already covered by a specific term or grouping of terms. This means that there is a lot of research involved. For example, um, finding examples of the proposed terms used, showing how it's different from the other terms, how it can relate or doesn't relate to the terms that already exist, and finding specific pieces of materials that the proposal term can be applied to are all necessary components. This is one of the few situations where I'm so happy that there is a dictionary or an encyclopedia that created for just about every subject because they are extremely useful in this process. Again, Xavier has been instrumental in finding bibliographic resources while I have been reviewing accepted proposals and I'm currently in contact with the heads of the African American SACO funnel to see how this funnel can help us draft the proposal. SACO, which is S-A-C-O, is the Subject Authority Cooperative Program, which is a branch of the Program for Cooperative Cataloging or the PCC. Um, both of these are run out of the Library of Congress, and they are the major cataloging groups that we all default to. And Mississippi State Libraries is a part of the PCC funnel. SACA reviews proposals for all Library of Congress controlled vocabularies, and so that is why we are deferring to their judgment. Since we're dealing with sheet music, the funnel recommended that we also look at submitting a proposal to the Library of Congress genre and form terms. This is a very similar pro process to the subject headings, but instead of describing what a resource is about, it focuses on what a resource is. Racial, racial performances may need to become racial performance songs or racial performance music instead of just being racial performances. The overall end goal with these proposals is to provide better descriptions that can assist the users in their research. End slide. Okay, I think next up we have yeah. Xavier. If y'all ha have any questions, we know you might, uh, you can feel free to uh, to contact Lauren or uh, or myself, we're happy to uh, to tell you more about it um, or anything you've got questions about. But without uh, without further delay, we will, we're going to turn it over to Xavier. Assuming okay. So next up, we have Xavier with metadata musical perspectives on digital archives management. Go ahead, Xavier. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Xavier Savelles. I'm a current PhD candidate with the history department uh, at Mississippi State University. I think you're, hold on. You're gonna, I'm going to turn your, because your camera. Xavier, you're muted. Okay. Okay. Take three. All right. Um, I'm Xavier Savelles. I'm a current PhD candidate uh, with the history department at Mississippi State University. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about a uh, user and scholar perspective on the wider project uh, that Mississippi State University um, and the Special Collections and Archives units are doing with um, the sheet music with um, descriptive equity um, and my experience with the whole skill portion as well as looking at these materials both as um, a researcher as well as someone trying to work on that project. Um, so a little bit about my particular research interest and how I got to special collections with the skill 
um, program is that my research focuses on um, African American queer gender and sexual identities um, in early 20th century popular music, uh, particularly looking at the blues genre. Uh, so things like sheet music and the uh, Charles H. Templeton Sr. sheet music collection at Mississippi State are extremely valuable to my research. Um, and I'm familiar with a lot of the themes and the subjects as well as just the songs and the music uh, that they deal with. And one thing in particular that my research deals with is this wider phenomena known as coon shouters and coon songs. Um, so Mississippi State University has a, a unique set of songs by a famous coon shouter by the name of Mae Irwin. Um, and also disclaimer throughout this uh, presentation, I might be using a uh, language that we now know is racially and socially unacceptable and insensitive. Um, that is not my thoughts or, or, or my opinions, of course, but it is the, the language used in these songs and, and has a lot to do with how um, I went about describing them and, and trying to get a sense of their meaning. Uh, but Mayorin was a particular uh, artist during the early uh, 20th century who was labeled as a coon shouter who were um, mostly uh, Caucasian women uh, who sung coon songs or these black based minstrel songs. Um, and if you look on the screen, you can see uh, two songs that Mississippi State has that she was very famous for, um, in particular the Spanish coon as well as all coons look alike to me. And looking at these songs, of course, uh, and particularly these pieces of sheet music, you would think, okay, well, it's clearly racist because of the, the word coon, right? It has that racial epithet in it. Um, but there's a lot going on here um, that is different from kind of earlier blackface music um, where we don't necessarily see in many of these songs um, a, a, a dark and corked up face or, or red lips. Um, but you'll have a picture of the artist um, often if you look on the left, you'll see that the uh, picture is actually photographed so um, and autographed. So it's this uh, new type of popular music industry business aspect that comes along with it um, that is kind of this modernized minstrel, modernized version of blackface that I like to uh, call it. And so this in particular deals with my research because May Irwin um, oftentimes in her songs was singing from a unique male perspective um, while performing not in blackface in many of her performances, just in full um, vaudeville uh, ball gown regalia. And it was just part of her act that she did for many years. Uh, so it has a lot of different aspects that come along with it. But as far as the particular project um, with manuscripts and special collections, um, I was looking at the Charles H. Templeton Sr. Um, Music Museum and the Sheet Music Collection, um, which is about 20,000 or more um, pieces of individual sheet music. Um, and I was responsible for um, really trying to see how this can be made accessible for both scholars as well as the general public. Um, and in particular, uh, I wanted to try to update many of these archival descriptions, um, looking at um, descriptive metadata, um, coming up with individual abstracts from uh, for each genre of racial performance, um, that's black face, red face, brown face, and yellow face. Um, I actually uh, went into it thinking that I would do an individual abstract for each song. Um, but as already stated, we started this project in late September, early October. Uh, um, so there wasn't a lot of time to really do each individual song. So I made these broader categories um, for the songs, uh, as well as looking at a uh, library of Congress subject headings and keywords and trying to come up with different ideas that, that better fit these songs and themes um, that sometimes weren't necessarily in the Library of Congress's um, larger subject heading group, um, but also creating um, application profiles um, and trying to connect um, the broader in-depth archival uh, metadata perspective um, with pop cultural scholarship and pop cultural history. Um, and doing this, of course, I was really looking at many of the important elements of racial performance, racial performance music, um, and it, uh, it its correlations to uh, visual media, so sheet music, um, again, trying to tease out what are the aspects that makes blackface, blackface, uh, redface, redface, yellowface, et cetera. Um, and that really required me to bring in other scholarly voices um, with through secondary sources and books that have been published kind of in the fields of racial performance and um, popular culture. Um, and in the end, 
I ended up creating um, a book list um, for different groups, um, not only uh, the racial performance genres, but also popular music history more broadly, um, as well as the relationships between popular music and race um, to kind of set a standard uh, format for how anyone can take these books, look at similar sheet music and replicate these projects at other universities, other institutions, what have you. Um, and also creating a workflow. Um, of course, looking at uh, over 20,000 songs can be extremely tedious. Um, as I will get into with a few examples here shortly, um, some of these songs have different aspects and flavors that don't necessarily strike uh, modern audiences um, as being um, immediately racist. It's just, oh, this is a picture that's supposed to depict a particular type of person or a particular subject, um, but that's where grounding them in their wider um, historical context, things going on with race and immigration during that period, really makes them significant and really shows how this is the, the evolution of race um, and, and uh, popular music and pop cultural um, performances of race. Uh, so a little bit more on how I came up with this general application profile or, or standard format of how this should work. Um, the first part was trying to address the what or why. So really saying, what is this and why is it offensive? Why was it offensive? Um, so of course that meant I had to create, see which category it fell into, um, what race it's trying to depict. Oftentimes you will have some mashups where you'll have songs dealing with both blackface as well as redface in the same song. So really trying to see which songs we're trying to get at particular racial themes, um, which is partially the easiest part, I, I think, of this process was seeing, okay, this is clearly um, depicting a Native American or a um, Asian immigrant. Um, but the second part was a little bit more tricky, um, and that is the ID categories or saying, how is this racist? Um, and there are three main ways that many of these songs um, at the turn of the 20th century um, really evoked these racial themes. Um, the first one is cover art. Um, so that was your common depictions of African Americans. And again, this, this darked up face with larger red lips, um, but also um, depictions of Asian Americans, uh, Native Americans, as well as European immigrants that tried to play on these very um, racialized themes. And they did that um, not only through caricatures, uh, but also um, text and, and word art and font. Um, and another way that I looked at this was from the lens of lyrics and song titles. Um, so some lyrics and song titles would just give it away. Um, they would be labeled as coon songs, or they would have these very nonsensical terms, particularly um, with um, yellow face depictions of Asian Americans uh, trying to um, evoke on these sounds um, that I'll get into actually in the next slide. Um, but also uh, the third one is, is sometimes you get both. You get, you get a two for one where you have these kind of broad broader, more clear racial categories in the cover art, but also um, titles and song lyrics that were included as well. So kind of looking at this on the ground, um, if we look at Yellowface, for example, as an application profile, um, during the early 20th century shift to a more standardized popular music industry, um, racist and racial depictions actually exploded um, and went beyond your, your older blackface tropes with things like Jump Jim Crow or Zip Coon um, to include these other racial groups that were coming into America at this time. Um, and as you see here, uh, one of these was Yellowface. Um, and it corresponded with this wider period known as the Yellow Peril, um, which was this racial color metaphor that really depicted um, peoples of East and Southeastern Asia as being this existential threat to the Western world. Um, and in particular, the United States, when we're talking about things like the Chinese Exclusion Act and the, the building of the, the Transcontinental Railroad, there's kind of these very aggressive and oftentimes very violent um, clashes that happen between the races. Um, but as it pertained to popular music and pop culture, um, we get these, these common stereotypes that come out. And in particular, we get the stereotype depiction of Asian immigrants as um, Fu Manchu um, or, or just broadly the Manchu um, that try to present depictions of Asians, particularly individuals from China um, as kind of these broad, um, everyone looks alike, dresses alike, sounds alike, uh, caricatures that were very harsh and very negative and didn't depict these broader aspects of assimilation that were going on. 
And in particular with popular songs, they generalized actual elements of Asian culture, um, particularly um, the national dress of the Manchu peoples of China. Uh, so as you can see in both of the images on the screen, um, you kind of get the um, typical Manchu or Manchuko dress um, with the tunic and the hat um, and also the longer braids. Um, but also there are these more uh, aggressive and derogatory depictions of how um, Asians uh, were supposed to look um, so without going too much into detail, if you look um, at figure one with Chinky Chiny Boogeyman, um, you kind of get this depiction of long fingernails, a long mustache, kind of evoking that, that Fu Manchu um, character uh, or, or villain that many people are familiar with. Um, and was kind of this extension of a broader um, cultural movement known as Orientalism, uh, which attempted to uh, imitate aesthetics of the East. Um, whether by using certain patterns or prints, so how we commonly think of um, fine china, um, oftentimes if you look at porcelain um, vases or, or fine china um, silverware or dishes, you'll see these, these uh, Chinese uh, depictions or, or Japanese depictions around the borders of them, um, but also trying to extend it in this period to this more negative racial um, stereotype. Uh, so if we look at figure two um, with Harold Weeks's hit song Chong, um, we kind of get this common uh, yellow face depiction. Um, and so if you look at the screen, uh, you see again uh, this, this stereotype depiction of how all people from China or just Asian immigrants, um, according to people at the time, are supposed to look, um, but also the name Chong, uh, a name that uh, they, they would oftentimes throw out as being a common Asian name or everyone has this particular name. Um, but if you look at the actual uh, text, uh, the word art is trying to evoke this kind of Asian oriental theme, um, but also the title is kind of playing on this theme of broken English um, by saying um, he comes from Hong Kong. Uh, with this particular song, they take it a step further um, with the actual lyrics of this song. And again, disclaimer, um, these aren't my um, uh, themes or, or my thoughts, but th this is the actual music uh, that we're dealing with here. Um, the chorus of the song reads, Chong, no like of that song, where Chinamen cry, way up high, sing sung hey, mung hey, Chong, go back to Hong Kong. So kind of this lyrical hodgepodge of sounds that were, were trying to evoke the sound of, of, of Mandarin or the sound of Japanese without really addressing these cultures on their own terms. Um, and this is, again, a theme that would be uh, duplicated 10 years later um, with Chinky Chiny Boogeyman. Um, and with this particular song, you get this even more direct um, year, uh, yellow peril um, depiction um, as you have this iconography of, of the Manchu, again, uh, this Fu Manchu character lo uh, looming over the city, right, looming over the town as this boogeyman. Um, but when you get to the lyrics of the song, it, it, it's more jazzy than it is really trying to um, express this anti-Chinese uh, immigrant sentiment. Uh, but as always, there's more than just the, this one particular genre. So another interesting aspect of this period is uh, red face songs, uh, which oftentimes took on more subtle um, racial depictions and, and racial stereotypes than we would um, commonly think of, um, particularly for this period. Um, and here we have a series of songs um, by Theodore F. Morse, known as the um, Arowana series, uh, which has a lot to do uh, with racial assimilation and Indian removal, um, with things like the Dawes Act going on during this period. Um, so if you look at figure one, it's actually the first song in the series. Um, that comes out in 1906. Um, and if you look, uh, you can see kind of this uh, common stereotypical depiction of um, an Indian maiden, oftentimes they refer to in these songs as having the single feather peeking out of a teepee, um, but also kind of the, the um, stereotyped uh, tribal print on the cover of the um, sheet music. But if you look, behind the tribal print in figure one, you can actually see shamrocks, uh, which is an integral part um, to the Arowana story because the, the basic plot of the song is that you have Arowana, um, this Indian maiden, Indian princess, um, who's approached by an Irish immigrant who's conveniently named Barney Carney, 
Um, so this is one of those songs where you get another mashup of they're, they're dealing with two types of racial stereotypes, um, both uh, red face dealing with Native Americans, but also green face dealing with uh, Irish immigrants. And so in the first song, he's trying to win her over. Um, and it has a lot to do uh, with this wider um, the satisfaction that we see um, in Red Face and Red Face songs of trying to depict um, Native American women as these um, defenseless um, squaws or maidens who are rescued by the, these larger than life um, white figures. Um, and in particular, um, historian uh, Rihanna Green has labeled this as the Pocahontas Perplex, um, which essentially not only um, portrays Native American women um, as being exotic or submissive, um, overall dehumanizing their image, um, but also it's trying to depict them as assimilating into American society. Um, and this is going on, um, again, with things like the Dawes Act of 1887, um, the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, um, which were geared towards uh, assimilating um, Native Americans. We often associate this, of course, with the um, adage, um, kill the Native, save the man. Um, and, and that's really what these songs are talking about. Um, as Rihanna Green put it, she said, that these uh, Native women in these songs, quote, had to keep their exotic distance or die. Um, and we see this um, in figure two, um, which is kind of this sequel or follow-up uh, to Morse's uh, earlier song, um, Since Arowana Married Barney Carney, um, where in a way, um, Arowana has metaphorically died, right? She has, has, has forsaken her native heritage. So if you look in this picture right now, she's wearing dresses um, that have the um, shamrock print on it, but also the chief is now decked out in green, right? He also has the shamrock print on his headband. And the song says, um, it, in particular, that since Arowana has married Barney Carney, right, that um, the native no longer paints his face or, or does a war cry, right, and really trying to play up on these themes that we see in um, Wild West shows put on by figures like Buffalo Bill um, that are trying to depict Native Americans as savage, warlike, uh, but with these uh, female figures like Arowana, the message is trying to get them to blend and meld into American society um, without portraying these more um, aggressive and uh, extremely harsh things that were going on on the ground. So those are just two examples of how I kind of looked at these songs and tried to merge um, both, okay, what is the sheet music doing, right? What is the music doing, but also this wider period of uh, Indian removal or Chinese exclusion dealing with Yellowface that really shows the, the larger social and political context um, that these songs were in. Uh, and of course, uh, doing this required me to read, read tons of books, um, pull tons of sources, and this is just a, a short list of the secondary sources that I looked at. Um, and again, as you can see, um, they're divided into different categories, ones that deal specifically with the genre of uh, racial performance, but also the wider relationships between race and popular culture and popular music um, that really uh, get to the heart of how these songs are playing with both uh, musical themes and terms, but also broader racial and cultural divides. Uh, so trying to attach this to uh, this, why does this matter, right, or why is this important? Um, when we're looking at a lot of these songs, um, again, it, at the at first glance, songs like Arowana can go past you without seeming extremely racial or racialized. But when you dig into it a little bit more um, and look at both the iconography and the lyrics and kind of where is this song coming from because they don't exist in a vacuum, you get a better sense of how they're dealing with race. Um, and oftentimes it is in this derogatory way. Um, and when we're talking about songs that aren't uh, blackface songs or aren't coon songs, it becomes more imperative to really investigate the, the motives of these songs. And yes, look at them on their historical terms, right? Looking at them as a piece of history. Okay, what does this mean for uh, 1903 or 1906, whenever the song is published, but also trying to reconcile that um, with 
uh, modern audiences, right? So that's where more of the user friendliness comes in um, because of course, as a scholar or as just a member of the general public looking at these songs, um, particularly from a, a minority perspective, some of these things might be shocking or jarring. Um, so when we're talking about uh, descriptive equity and trying to make sure on the metadata end that you know we catalog these songs, we put out a disclaimer about why this song is racist or, or what this song is doing for its period, um, that's the, the moment to address that history um, and do it in an impactful way. Uh, and again, looking at it from the perspective of other scholars really helps to broaden that narrative and kind of make it make sense. And if you have any questions or concerns, this is my contact information. And I thank you for your time and for listening. Okay, thanks y'all. Um, does anybody have any questions for Jennifer, Lauren, or Xavier? If you do, you can put it in the chat or, um, or you can turn on your mic and ask. I think this one is for Xavier. Um, Jess Brown wants to know when can we read your publication? <laughs> okay. So the question was when can when can we read your publication? That's for you. Um, I have two more years in the PhD program. Uh, so by 2024, I have some sort of dissertation out there. Um, however, I did recently publish a piece. Uh, with the Washington Post uh, dealing with um, Black trans identity and the history of that and its relationships with um, Blackface menstruacy. Uh, so that is one publication that I have out there that deals kind of with this history of racial performance um, and lived experience. Oh, duty with the lick, I think, yeah. All right. Hi. Uh, this is Cynthia Lewis, uh, and I am just so encouraged by all of your presentations. I remember uh, in the 80s, uh, late 80s, when a lot of um, the collection efforts were being done, and then when we were surveying uh, African American materials um, at Jackson State. So this has, you know, um, I'm away from the state now, I'm, I'm in Georgia, but uh, this is reflected, especially this particular collections and uh, at that time, uh, the urgency of trying to make sure that these things would be saved and and appreciated for the future. So it's, it's just good for me to see that this has actually happened, even though it's still recently being at, at the forefront, but uh, I think of, you know, Bill Ferris and Susan and, and a lot of those other um, objectives long years ago. So thank all of you and I look forward to seeing more. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, we have a question in chat. Were there any specific documentation or guideline processes that you incorporated into this project? That might be for Lauren, maybe. The founding document that we used was Mary Berry's um, template. Dorothy. Dorothy, Dorothy Berry. Dorothy Berry, sorry. Slip of the tongue. Um, it was Dorothy Berry's um, materials, but we also used a lot of um, 
Oh my goodness. In general, Mississippi State Libraries has been trying to update um, all of our metadata. We have been doing a lot to make it in general more accessible, more discoverable through anti racist descriptions as well as um, ADA accessibility. And so I'm trying to find the exact wording for. Dorothy Berry's description of her work goes into a lot of detail on her process, and that was what we really were thinking about and, and basing this on. Um, and so it's sort of an additional application of that work. She because she was she was doing that work on very similar collection on very similar material in Harvard's collections. Only it's only hers was more specific to blackface. And when we kind of when we got it and when Xavier got into this was when we were really looking at it going, oh, you know, there's more here happening than just blackface minstrelsy. So how can we. How can we expand our equity work to include. More than just blackface minstrelsy and encompass other racial performance happening here. So I've got one of our documents pulled up and um, we also try and incorporate um, archive for black lives in Philadelphia's anti-racist description resource into a lot of our materials. And we are slowly trying to incorporate um, the protocols for Native American archival materials and we focus on the WCAG, which is on uh, the WCAG's um, stamp guides for um, ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act um, accessibility. And so that's just overall for the project. Um, Xavier, with his particular guide, really worked on his own, and I let him take free reign on the beginning steps of it because, again, he is the subject matter expert. But as we go through with it, as we work with it, we're going to fine tune it, and then it will be incorporated into our overall metadata guide. And I see that we have a question um, speak more to the process progress for adding racial performances to the Library of Congress. Okay. <laughs> it's a process. Because um when originally Xavier and I started to look at these terms, the terms that he gave to me were um coon songs and coon shatters to be added. And so that is where a lot of our work originally began was trying to figure out a way to incorporate those. But the big thing that's come back from the heads of the um, African American Seiko funnel, and that was is that Library of Congress in general is trying to move away from any offensive terms being a main subject heading term. And while we definitely had the background knowledge to make a very good argument for it. Because I mean, Xavier really dove in and was able to find lots of amazing materials. I was able to find a lot of music dictionaries that actually show these words being used and how they are recognized genres. It would still be kind of, it would still be a hard fight, even though we would have been well documented. And so then Xavier came up with the idea of racial performances to really incorporate all the type, all the faces written on and beyond and going beyond blackface, which I, um, when I was going through my initial search of the Library of Congress website and all their proposals, didn't come up with that. And I never saw it in my mind. It's like, OK, we talk about minstrelly. We talk about um, all these other type of racist and prejudiced materials. This has got to be in there. And it's actually not. It was a little bit mind boggling. So currently right now, that is what we are working on. Um, I'm going to be sending follow up letters to the funnel soon, trying to get some more feedback from them. And it's a, the, the form itself is you have to access it through class web, which is a paid subscription that we have because we are part of the PCC funnel. And for that, um, you have to have the exact term that you want to use. You need to have the exact piece of information, the object that you want to apply it to. And so I'm going to get a list of probably between 10 and 15 different specific pieces of sheet music that we have. And so that'll help bolster it. And then we have 
uh, Xavier, you saw Xavier's bibliography. We're going to be using all those materials to add in what's known as a 670 note for those of you who work in the cataloging world to really help address all of this. So right now we are still, uh, I'm still working on getting all the materials and getting feedback and then all of the things that I have are going to get plugged into the actual form. If that answers your question, Liz. We have another awesome. question for Xavier. Um, you may have mentioned this. Um, what made you pick this topic? Was it something you came into the archives already looking for? Or did you pick the topic based on the materials? The topic uh, for this discussion or my broader research and what I'm dissertating on. What do you um, mean? The, it, the... it doesn't really specify. Mona says both in the chat. She says both. Oh, okay. Um, thank you for your question. So, as far as my broader research interests, um, where, where do I start? Um, I grew up in a musical household. Um, I took piano lessons from the age of six all the way up to 16. So that's 10 years. That was a grueling process in and of itself, but also, you know, growing up with older relatives who had you know, blues records and just listening to them talk about growing up in the 20s and 30s. I was always surrounded by these conversations about blues and music. Um, and then, of course, uh, at my age now, growing up in this moment where everyone's talking about people like Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith and um, others who kind of had this queer expression of identity in their music. Um, it, I, I tried to merge the two because I think it's an important conversation to be had um, as far as dealing with you know, contemporary musical celebrities like Lil Nas X, who is embracing this queer um, identity and expressing it through his music. You know, there's this much longer history of it, you know, that goes not only beyond Little Richard, but also even beyond Ma Rainey. Um, and it's kind of like this information has been here all along and people have talked about it from all these different angles, really other than the musical angle. So that's what kind of brought me into it from a research and dissertation perspective. Um, as far as this particular um, project, because May Irwin is kind of this epicenter um, in a way um, for this particular type of, of uh, coon song I look at called the Bully Song, um, which is this new thing that happens in um, 1885 or 1895, uh, with her performance in The Widow Jones, um, which deals with this razor-toting, city-slick, um, blackface character um, who's violent, who's deadly, um, but it also has these overt sexual um, tones that deal with uh, a longer history of the black male body um, without going into too much graphic detail. Um, it has a lot to do with sex, sexuality, and then her performance of it as a Caucasian woman on a stage, again, not in blackface, just this is part of her repertoire. There's this musical queerness that happens, a musical queering. Um, so that kind of brought me uh, into this project because we have these authentic May Irwin pieces of sheet music um, that deal with this subject matter. Uh, so those are my two whys. And, and the other the other part of it uh, was that the first skill there were the skill internship is two semesters. The first semester he spent processing some of our other sheet music collections, and then to continue that but to sort of do a little bit of branching off. So it was a new skill. Uh, we went with a uh, digital humanities slash metadata option, and it happened to come at the same time as we got that inquiry from the public about. Uh, contextual information for the material on display in Templeton. So we very much were like, okay, let's just, you know, grab the synchronicity here with both hands. And, um, and here we are, <laughs> we really, we have somebody here who has a great depth of subject knowledge that frankly, the rest of us do not have, uh, and who's interested in this and who, and we can really create a solid, uh, you know, well-researched scholarly, um, product. To that will only amplify and support what we're trying to do with, uh, with education and humanities and our digital collections. So, um, does that does that help, Mona? Maybe. She says great. Okay. <laughs> 
Any other questions? Okay, well, that concludes day one of SMA's annual meeting. Um, if you think of other questions, you can feel free to contact.